Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. The land issue is on everyone's mind these days, especially with President Cyril Ramaphosa's promise that land will be expropriated without compensation, albeit with a proviso that it would be done in a way that would not harm the economy or food security. So this is a good time to talk to one of the co-authors of the book, Rights to Land, a Guide to Tenure, Upgrading and Restitution in South Africa. With me is Peter Delius. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start off with talking about the three co-authors and your backgrounds. Well, there's myself and Professor Baynard from Oxford University, who go back a very long way together. We both did our PhDs in the 1970s on land issues in South Africa uh, from a primarily historical perspective. And then the third author is uh, Dr. Michelle Hay, who did a PhD under me fairly recently, also on the land issue. Uh, and did a, a really outstanding piece of work. So between us all, between William and myself, we've been researching land issues for most of our adult lives. And in recent years, we've really felt that the, the, the debate tends to operate at a very superficial and often quite highly racialized level. And we wanted to move beyond that and try and look at some of the, the detail of how the policies worked out on the ground and try to suggest constructive solutions, ways of moving forward to solve this issue, which is a long festering problem for South Africa. Now, before we get into looking at that and what suggestions you found during your research, um, you looked at the history as well, quite a yes. bit in the book describing the history of, of land tenure and restitution. Yes. So if we look at the history of land tenure, mm. um, what, how did it start? What were the, the main issues in the beginning? Well, to start with, what you have, of course, in South Africa is, is uh, the local population, people living here, who de developed their own systems of land tenure. And then from the time of white settlement, you have a, an imperial colonial system which comes on into play and imposes its own kind of land system on that pre-existing system. And it doesn't really recognize the rights that are vested in that pre-existing system. And over a long period of time, land is expropriated from the indigenous population of South Africa and appropriated by that colonial imperial system. And what it does is it develops a highly skewed distribution of land in which uh, white South Africans get the overwhelming majority of the land and black South Africans are left with the, 13, the famous 13%. Um, it also, at the same time, strengthens rights to land and creates systems of property and private property in land for white residents uh, and in fact steadily diminishes the strength of the rights to land that exist within the black areas of South Africa. So you have two problems. You have one, the massive expropriation of land, the other, the steady diminishing and undermining of black of the nature of black rights in that. So there was a time that um, I think 35 or 30 or 35 percent of blacks owned land in South Africa? I think it's a, there's a slightly different underlying reality. Um, I, the, the, the proportion would not, would not have been that high. Um, but the underlying reality is a slightly different one because it relates to customary law. Now, in South Africa, African communities and other communities held land according to their own legal systems and rights in land. Within those legal systems, in fact, the rights to land that households had and individual had were very, very strong. They were akin to a property right. You couldn't, people could not be dispossessed of their land with short of being accused of treason. So you retain very strong rights in land and you pass those rights on through forms of inheritance to, to the next generation and so on to the next generation. Um, so you had a very strong locally rooted system of strong rights in land. Uh, what has happened is that that system has been steadily undermined. So certainly some Africans accumulated property in land, much less than the, than the figure that you're suggesting. And they were in many ways, uh, they were, uh, were very often uh, forcefully dispossessed of that property right in land. But underlying that was a very strong customary law right in land, which was also reduced and diminished. Mm -hmm. So if we still talk about uh, land tenure and uh, chieftaincies, yes. uh, the, the former 
uh, uh, Bantustans, for example. Yes. Um, how would land in that area be tenured at the moment? Well, a lot of that, that land is held under, under a system of what is loosely described as communal tenure. Um, but there are also a number of other systems which overlay that, the PTO system um, and, and a number of others. Those are, are, were regarded as being an expression of, or argued by some to be an expression of the rights within customary law and land. But in fact, they weren't that. What they were was a significant diminution of the rights that had existed before and a transfer in control over land to white officials and to chiefs. So you had a complete change in the balance of power. So that, for example, you, today you have people making strong claims. On the one hand, the chiefs are the rightful owners of the land. And then on the other hand, you have a very strong resistance to that, saying that, in fact, it's ordinary households who had the strongest rights to land. Chiefs were not the owners of the land. They played some role in distribution. But to believe and suggest that they should be now uh, the owners of the land is, is a serious distortion of what historical reality is. So right. we have two big problems. We do indeed. Okay, so if we look at restitution, I think the, yeah. the main restitution started um, in 1994. Yes. Um, had, had it, did it achieve what it was supposed to achieve? No. Uh, and, and its goals got confused as it went along. Restitution was originally one leg of the whole land reform process. And it was recognised that a number of communities, particularly those, those communities who had acquired property in land within the kind of Western legal framework, had been cruelly dispossessed in the 20th century. If you think back on those, those black spot removals, mm -hmm. which were such a blight on the history of South mm -hmm. Africa in the 1950s and 1960s, when people were forced off land which they'd bought, had their, uh, had their possessions loaded onto wagons if they were lucky, and were dumped in the Bantu stands. So restitution started out as an idea of trying to give, give some return to those people who'd suffered that kind of form of dispossession. Um, and it was thought of as being a relatively short-term program which would perhaps last for about five years. And then a bigger program of land redistribution would, would take place in which there would be a much larger process of shifting land from white to black. What happened, in fact, is two things, is that the restitution process was overwhelmed by claims. There were 80,000 claims, many more than people expected. There was also a great deal of confusion about what the object of the policy was. Was it about righting these relatively limited wrongs, or at least providing compensation for them, or was it a push towards redistribution? And that confusion meant that, in fact, the more limited program was confused with a much bigger program. The land commissions were never resourced with the finances, with the skills, with the people, with the systems to actually manage this large number of claims. And very rapidly the process simply ground down and turned into the snail-like glacial process it has become. And we still have from that first system of land, first period of land restitution, we have something like 19,000 claims left in the system. And the calculations are that they will take about 43 years to settle at the current rate at a bill of 30 billion rand. Um, so it's unresolved, unfinished. And it means that many areas of the countryside are locked up by unresolved, unfinalized claims. Some of them claims over pre-existing claims. Uh, so that's something the society desperately needs to resolve. And of course the problem has been made even more acute by the fact that under President Zuma, uh, in, a, in an attempt to strengthen his alliance with chiefs and with rural people and also with a variety of, of BE partners, the land restitution process was reopened. And we had virtually double the amount of original claims which haven't been finished were lodged under the new system. So now we have 140,000 claims sitting in the system which have been frozen by the Constitutional Court because it said that you have to try and process the old ones first. But the current calculations are that the new claims will take 200 years <laughs> to finalise and will cost 600 billion <laughs> rand. So <laughs> we have a problem, a major problem. Oh. 
and, and, and it's a problem that, we, that in fact, because the Constitutional Court is about to adjudicate what should happen to those new claims, it's a, a problem that we as a society need to face and to try and come up with constructive, realistic solutions for how we can ensure that this mm -hmm. doesn't blight our future. So in the research that you did for yeah. the book, did you find any, do you have recommendations as to how this problem can be quickened? Yes, we, we, you know, what we try to do in the book is to, in the, in the key areas which we operate, which is tenure and restitution, to set out a set of concrete proposals. So it's not just critique, it's proposal. And our argument really is that we, we need to focus on the old order claims, the original round claims. We need to provide the resources, many of which are administrative and, and research skill resources, to ensure that we deal with those as rapidly as possible. That we need to strengthen the land claims court, which has been grotesquely underfunded and, and understaffed, and therefore not able to operate and that that should be our national priority. We, we, we believe that the 140,000 new claims, to try and process them in the way that the old order claims have been processed, is simply to lock ourselves in an unending uh, sort of crisis around the land, and, and we believe that steps should be taken to uh, effectively deal with those claims in a different kind of much more rapid way. Wow. So, Professor Delius, thank you for talking to us. This is just a taste um, of, of uh, all of the research uh, and findings that you, that you did in the book. Um, for example, we didn't even get to mining and mining rights yes. and, and how it, uh, it affects the um, land yes. tenure and the people. Yes. The book that we were talking about is this one, Rights to Land, A Guide to Tenure, Upgrading and Restitution in South Africa. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. Thanks for watching. <laughs>